what makes this interesting. Oh, that's really cool. No, yeah. definitely. I, I feel that. I think we have, we're, we're linking up with our engineers right now. And there's a weird thing where they're over here calling it the UX framework and we're over here calling it a design system. And it's like, ah, oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's kind of where I'm going with this is that, you know, people are some people see it as a collection of things and then other people actually see it like a true system, I suppose. <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah. Exactly. Uh I'll jump in. Um let me uh let's get started. Um so eleven thirty six <laughs> here central time for us and about five thirty PM for James over in Dublin. Um, I just want to say thank you, everyone, for coming to Oklahoma uh, OKC Design and Tech. Um, we meet monthly, and we're sponsored by a nonprofit um, called Techlahoma. And our mission is to enrich Oklahoma's technologists of all backgrounds through education, connection, and opportunity. And myself, Doji, Gaia, and Alec have worked really hard this year to, you know, make virtual happen. And so we can all meet every month. Um, we're using Twitch, we're using YouTube, so feel free to join in. Um, uh, join in on the comments as well, so we'll answer questions throughout the, the talk, and then we'll also answer questions at the end, um, but also letting you guys um, Techlahoma is our primary sponsor, and if you, we are a safe space here, so if you have any questions or issues, um, there, we have a rule of conduct for Techlahoma on our website, techlahoma.org. But also feel free to reach out to myself or any of our co-organizers um, in person or um, via Slack, and we'll be able to help you out or um, answer any questions uh, needed. So um, let me dive in and talk about uh, James, our speaker, real quickly. Um, so he's a colleague of mine. He works at Global Payments. And uh, he's a senior design manager there, and he owns our design system. And he'll talk much more about that design system in a little bit and how it's come to be. Um, over the past seven years, James has also worked across a variety of different roles from marketing, user experience design, brand and strategy, motion, visual, front end architecture, um, and editorial design. So he certainly has a long slew of uh, uh, tools in his uh, toolkit, and we're really excited to have him here, again, all the way from Dublin. So he's, I believe he's our, our farthest speaker. So really excited to have him on here and get some good questions from you guys. So think on that. James, and I'll hand it off to you. Thanks, Tori. Um, yep, yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, Name is James Heffernan, Senior Design Manager at Global Payments. Happy to be with you all today to talk all things design systems. Um, I suppose the material that I've prepared uh, is taken from the perspective um, of, I suppose, an enterprise multi-brand design system. Um, but that being said, I'm sure that there's uh, plenty of uh, things in here for you all to take uh, something away um, from. Um, but to be honest, uh, the thing that I'm looking forward to the most today is our chat afterwards. Um, I'm interested to hear your thoughts, your challenges, you know, things that you've come up come up against, and I suppose really talk about all aspects of the system. So uh, don't hold back if you have any questions or we like touch on something, or if we don't touch on something in in the slides, uh, that doesn't mean I'm not going to talk about it. So feel free to ask me a question, and we'll we'll go through it. Um, so a little bit. Uh, about me before we start. Um, as Tori mentioned, I'm a product designer based out of Dublin, so you'll have to excuse the funny accent and probably the accidental Irishisms that will in, uh, ensue. Um, I didn't study product design at first. Uh, my degree was actually in, um, I suppose, this funny crossroads between design, programming, and film. And uh, so that, that being multimedia design. Um, Though, to be honest, uh, with all the changes that we've seen over the last decade, I'm not even sure if that degree exists anymore. Um, but in the context of what we're talking about today, it has certainly set me up well uh, for this kind of rapidly changing environment that we find ourselves in. Um, so just quickly, uh, who are Global Payments? What do we do? Um, uh, at our core, we are a payments processor. Um, headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia. We've about 24,000 employees worldwide, 
and we provide payment solutions uh, to small startups, to enterprise, and uh, to multinational companies. Um, for the past 50 years, we've been trusted by some of the uh, world's biggest brands uh, to, you know, across a number of sectors to kind of deliver uh, payments services to them. Um, we, don't worry, this talk is definitely not going to go into the history of payments or how all, you know, the architecture of how payments processors work. Um, but this piece here is a little bit crucial just in terms of, you know, what our design system has to uh, cover. Um, so this is a really simple uh, payments model. Um, as you can see in the middle there, that's where global payments traditionally traditionally uh, stood. Uh, you know, we were effectively the um, the gateway, if you will, into the rest of your uh, payments infrastructure or all of the other institutions that need to kind of partake in the you know, the life cycle of a transaction whenever one of us went into a store and we wanted to buy something. And I suppose the thing that's fairly amazing to me and it's still amazing to me today is that all of the communication and the systems that talk to each other every time that we pay for something with our card uh, happens within two seconds. Um, so there's a lot of different systems that are talking to uh, one another. But over the course of the last 10 years, global payments has grown through acquisition. Um, you saw what you'll notice at the top is while we used to be, a, I suppose, a, a payments provider, um, over, over the course of that time, we've slowly become much more uh, technology and uh, tech focused instead of just being a pure uh, play payments provider. Um, and that resulted in a, you know, a situation that looks a lot like this, where we're providing not only uh, services um, at a merchant's level, but also end users. So we have software there that's going to like, you know, everyday user like one of us. Um, and we also have, uh, you know, services like acquiring banking, which is banking services effectively for a business and uh, issuer uh, processing, which is a little bit complicated, but it's to do with um, the uh, institution that issues cards to a bank that ultimately gives it to you. Um, so what did that mean? Well, um, after all of this growth, it left our global product design team with a monumental task. You know, we ended up with, I suppose, three key questions. How might we unify our now 700 product experiences across our portfolio? So a few years ago, when all this started, uh, we did what every design system team tends to do. We're going to do a UI audit. And this was some of the stuff that came back. Um, so, you know, financial services aren't exactly known for uh, their great looks. Um, to be completely honest, some of the stuff that came back, I would say, has scarred me for life. Um, I'm talking about interfaces where their primary color is laser green or, uh, you know, like the old, um, like Microsoft systems from the 90s where you have like your blue screen of death, like that seriously, like bad stuff coming back. So, of course, our product team was kind of a bit like, oh, geez, you know, how are we going to do this? Um, another key question was, um, how uh, might we promote a culture of knowledge sharing across our team? And I suppose when you look at the, co like the context of product development in our business and the size of the organization, it's pretty understandable how a team may not even be aware uh, that a similar problem has already been solved. Um, some of you may have seen a diagram like this before, but effectively it illustrates uh, communication lines between team members. Um, so I suppose if you're coming from a smaller like agency setup, you probably would be more accustomed to the left-hand side where communication is relatively easy. Um, you know, three people, three lines of communication. Whereas on uh, our side is probably more uh, akin to what's on the right hand side where you've got teams that of eight people or more. If you have only eight members in your team, you actually have 28 lines of communication. So why am I showing you this? It was like, you know, 
even though it's quite simplistic, it does illustrate how quickly uh, our communication can lead to inconsistencies um, due to that ever expanding room for interpretation. And then I suppose another key question, but this is probably the same for most design systems, is how might we um, ensure consistent quality output across our portfolio? But maybe unlike other design systems, again, coming back to the problems at hand, um, we have 7,000, give or take, developers in the organization. And a large proportion of these, after we went out and did some research, uh, we found that they're self-proclaimed back-end devs that really don't want to be doing front-end stuff, but they have to do it. Um, and then aside from that, we have 180 de designers in the entire org, like that's it. Um, and I suppose the really tricky piece is that we're all dispersed across uh, 38 different locations around the world. So that left us with some pretty harsh realities that whatever um, system we put in place and whatever quality bar that we set in that system, um, you know, we're going to have to devise it in such a way that team members can actually hit that quality bar. Like there's no point in us uh, saying you have to do this and then actually we just don't have the talent or we don't have uh, the people uh, to hit that. So we were mindful of that when we were putting our system together and I think that really influenced the way that we um, ended up architecting this. Um, so around about this time, I came across uh, this quote from Mark Newson, who um, at the time this quote was penned, he was leading design on the uh, for 21st century car. Um, and I suppose what's interesting for me about this quote is that he's really describing the coming together of many different teams and expertise through a system. Um, to realize a product's potential. Um, so it might sound funny, but I suppose it's interesting when you talk about design systems to different groups. Some people think that they're just it's just design assets or it's just a code library or whatever. Um, but the more you delve into it, the more you realize that a lot of this is actually down to culture and it's down to people, um, but also those other assets and, and such play a big part in it as well. So surprise, surprise, the conclusion we came up with was uh, we needed to create um, a design system. Um, in the beginning, this uh, project was completely unofficial. Um, I would even take, take the word project, uh, you know, probably in a different sense now. We, we probably see our product, or sorry, our design system as a product as opposed to a project, but that's this point in time, um, you know, it was a project, it was kind of low key. There was a small group of us that started reading about design systems and going to conferences with Brad Frost and Nathan Curtis um, and heading to meetings, uh, meetups just like this one um, to seek out other people that had done it before um, or were in the process of creating a design system. Um, so as I say, we were all uh, doing this kind of on a voluntary basis. There was only about six of us. Um, there was three senior designers, uh, myself, Matt Bumby, Tyler Goss, and Paul Gillen. Um, our VP of product design, uh, Claire Bowden, was very supportive. And uh, Miguel Sanchez, who was our senior UI dev at the time. Um, we were coming at this from different sides of the business, different backgrounds, different cultures, different time zones. Um, but what we did was we worked on an initial strategy for our designed language, um, a component library, and a proof of concept while keeping up our day jobs. But a big question um, that we still had was, um, is this actually a system? Um, so. While this was going on, uh, one of our systems architects uh, approached me and he said, um, you know, James, I've got a book for you. I think you should read it. And it was called uh, Thinking in Systems by Danella Meadows. Um, and guys, like, I can't recommend this book enough. Um, it's very approachable. It's not about systems architecture, so you're not going to see a lot of 
uh, you know, code or complex systems in there, which can often be uh, the downer or the turnoff um, when it comes to kind of approaching this. Um, so I would highly recommend that you get a copy of that. I think you can get a Kindle book of it as well. Um, it's been a constant source of inspiration and definitely gave me a deeper understanding of systems concepts and traps. So um, this is the thing, I suppose, when you're getting into creating design systems at the beginning, everybody has seen material and everybody has seen, I suppose, the more tangible assets of the system, like the component library piece or, um, you know, your sketch uh, libraries or your Figma libraries. But there's a lot of things in a design system that make it a design system. And those pieces are really important, but they're only like one part of it. So I'll bring you through what that looks like in just a second. Um, if you're approaching atomic, you know, your design system from an atomic design perspective to see a quote that says that this is an interconnected set of elements is totally not going to come as a surprise. Um, but the harder question to answer for a lot of people is, uh, what is your system trying to achieve? You know, um, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, it's consistency, but you're like, you know, is there something more than that? Like, it, is, is that almost like just a very simple outcome, but it's not really the purpose of, of the system. Where we landed um, is that our design system's purpose is to pool shared assets which support global teams to build inclusive, unified products at, at scale so that we deliver value to our customers fast while minimizing costs to our business. Now that's a mouthful and there's a lot to unpack there, but it does really uh, link back into those three core questions that we had at the beginning and the overall, I suppose, scale of what we were trying to uh, tackle. But if we were to unpack it a little bit, we can start to see some tangible goals that we could track against. So the pooled assets piece, uh, we've kind of mentioned a few things there already, uh, you know, your component library and your Figma or Sketch library, whatever. Um, I suppose what's key here is that we are not thinking about these things as collections. We're not thinking about them as independent entities that have no relationship with each other. Um, there's definitely going to be crossover and uh, you know one is one one or both are going to inform each other. So we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Um, the supporting global teams that required us to do a lot more research. Um, so we needed to understand you know, what are the pain points of our internal users? Uh, what are their needs? What are their expectations? And ultimately, what's their journey like when they engage with the system? They might have, like, the, depending on your persona, if it's a designer or a developer or a product manager, they might have a lot of different touch points when they enter your system or use your system. So these are other things you need to think about. Um, we have a piece there that we need to build inclusive unified products um so what we're getting at here is that we needed to support our global initiative to be fully accessible um so we're looking at wcag double a sorry 2.1 double a that was the standard we need to support and then we need to start thinking about well from a systems perspective what does that mean how how can you impact that as an idea um and then finally before i move on um you know, we can start to unpack some of the kind of more deeper things here, like unification. What does that actually mean? Is it a design language or is there something else going on? It, you know, we spoke about that linear relationship between design and code. Um, so our design system has evolved a lot since the early days uh, when it was essentially a design language built around a few strategic uh, products uh, with the intention um, on the code side of supporting React and Angular components. Um, our current design system, unlike its predecessor, has a name. Um, it's called Index. Um, this would probably be my first tidbit of uh, useful information. Uh, when you are creating a design system, give it a name. It sounds really simple, but it's actually really powerful because it gives you you know, it gives you and your team or your external members of your team that you're trying to adopt the system 
something to rally behind because when you just have a generic design system no one really knows what that is and they also don't know how to describe it or connect with it so give it a name uh, make it somewhat per, uh, you know relatable to the business that you're in and that can be like your first uh, you know port of call in terms of trying to up your adoption numbers um okay that makes so much sense in terms of just you know we say in terms of personas we say let's give the persona a name let's make it personable let's humanize this as opposed to just saying oh our design system design system like you know let's use it um it doesn't hit home as much if you don't name it and that, that is something so simple but i actually hadn't thought about that before yeah and it's funny actually how we came up with that name as well um I probably haven't talked about this enough yet today anyway, but all of this has been like collaboration. It's been collaboration uh, with our design team and our engineers and our architects and, you know, people in operations, people like well outside of like the product sphere. Um, and I suppose the thing uh, for us is that we realize um, there were kind of like different camps in the business and Index was going to be this place where all of that kind of thoughts and um you know assets and such all kind of converge so it's like the single source of truth type idea um but of course uh we needed a lot of buy-in from our engineering camp which was the biggest camp there um so we decided we'd call it index because it has uh you know it kind of captures what we're trying to do we're trying to index all of the way that you all the ways you uh create the parts that you use to create your products and um, it has that very kind of like techy nerdy connection with like html because index that html is your first page and so was, there was a few different ideas in there but it's funny because the group that we target this at you know obviously the engineering group uh really caught on to it so uh whether that's down to the name and you know the nuances we're not sure but um you know and it had the desired effect so it was good um and i suppose the one thing that has changed as i said from our original design system proof of concept is that that concept was only looking at design language and plus react and angular for our web or for our component library but our new system so index is now um a framework agnostic system so that means you can use any framework that you want with it. Um, it supports web, native, hybrid, and legacy applications across our multiple brands. So a bit of work there. Um, if we're to look at the system structure, this would be like a really simplified version. It's probably the only use case for this particular slide is in a fancy presentation um, to leadership, but uh, you know, it's a it's a good first step it shows you that you know at the core of it you've got your principles and your governance and then you wrap that in your with your design assets so that might be your design kit and your component library that are informed by your design language and then wrapping that you've got ops and so on and so forth but in reality and this is where this will probably be a lot more valuable to everyone on the call your design system actually looks like this um so what you've got is you know a number of different elements you've got very um stark relationships between those um and to be honest like this is going to be different for every business like everybody that's on this call it'll probably look different and um, there will be obviously the landmark things like your design language and your component library will probably exist but the relationships between these elements will change based on the nature of your business what your system's trying to accomplish um you know your goals and i suppose ultimately the culture in the business as well like not only did we have to unify these 700 products um but we had to do it in a way that's like really scalable very flexible you can use multiple brands which means that you're going to have to make a call about what goes into your design language um where do themes come into it are they in the language are they a different thing outside of the language what inherit like what what do your tokens point to, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I suppose the index system is probably a little bit more complicated than this, but this, this at least is a good talking point for today where we can 
go through it. So you'll see like stuff like there's in the governance box, we've got, you know, resourcing and version control and security and compliance and our documentation, of course. And then there's also like that operations layer, which people often forget, like, how are you going to maintain this? How are you, you know, how are you going to fix bugs? It, it has to be living. It can't be like I shipped my design system and now it's done forever. That's just not how these things work. Um, how we got to this is, uh, as I say, we had uh, product designers and we had our UI devs, but we also had the likes of research and cloud architecture and tech leads from different systems, security, compliance operation. And that's how this picture was formed. Um, so, you know, the big question you often get when you go to design system meetups is like, how do I get it? How do I get buy-in to make something like this? And the answer is you're going to have to network a lot. Uh, you're going to have to buy a lot of coffees and probably have a lot of pints. Um, it's basically you need to get people on your side and you need to start thinking about um, how can we use this kind of shared resource um, to generate like value for the business. Like what are the things that we constantly keep rebuilding that we don't need to rebuild? We don't need to reinvent the wheel every time. There's going to be some things in our current day to day that we could just say this is the way forward and then we build on it from there. So that's, you know, the way that you get buy-in for this is a lot of legwork um, and ultimately getting a lot more champions in those different areas. Like for us, it was engineering. We had to go out and get some uh, devs and some uh, tech leads and architects to kind of see things the way we were seeing things. And then things became a lot easier. Um, I've just broken down that crazy ass diagram into um, something that we can read. Um, so when you have this blanket view of your system, when we go back to that statement where we needed to look at accessibility, that becomes way easier. It's like way easier to understand and figure out and plan how you're going to attack that. You can see which parts of your system um, are going to be impacted and ultimately uh, give you that outcome of being accessible by design. Um, you know, in this case, there's going to be an operations impact. There's going to be a governance impact because your documentation is in there. We can assess which parts of our design language we're going to need to update and consequently what the impact would be in our component library. But if you don't see things kind of meshed together or having at least having some sort of a relationship between one another, um, you might make a really good, really accessible, uh, inclusively minded Figma file but the second you ship that over to development, they kind of kick all that stuff out the window because there was no connection there originally. So um, again, that's why having this more kind of broad view of your system and all those interconnected relationships will help you to solve these bigger problems. Then we get into this, which is what really scares people is this idea of having systems inside other systems. Um, but what I'll say is this actually gives you a lot of flexibility um, and it allows your system to be much more scalable. So this is actually an example uh, that exists in Index today, uh, where inside of our foundations, which would be the same as, I suppose, your atomic structures, if you're following atomic design, <clears throat> we have our color system. And inside that, we have this division between what would be considered, I suppose, your utility palette and what actually belongs to your brand identities. Um, and the reason for that is if we're gonna go and support accessibility, um, you can't really get into a scenario where you are modifying your brand palette um, to support that because then you'll end up with inconsistencies uh, from a branding perspective. So, you know, this is probably one of the benefits of a design system that you can at least uh, create these subsystems and then have those conversations if your brand team exists outside of your product team, which is the case in global payments. Um, the same could be said for a typography system. Um, you know, we alluded earlier, alluded to the fact earlier on that the company is a global company, which means, uh, you know, one typeface may not necessarily uh, work everywhere if you're going to try and support Latin characters and Cyrillic characters and, you know, all the uh, Asian characters, 
and there's very few typefaces that are going to do that for you. So you're going to have to come up with some sort of system to designate uh, what you use where, what the rules for that are, what are the use cases. So what do you use in your UI? What do you use in your uh, maybe your API Explorer, where sans serif mightn't be the the go-to. It might be monospace or whatever. So you know this is just another example of if you can think about systems within systems, you actually end up with something that's really flexible. Another big question, um, and it's actually funny how many times I get asked this question, even by a designer that literally joined the company yesterday and maybe hasn't actually gone through the system yet. <laughs> I get asked this question, how do I change the system? Um, so the first thing I would say on this is that if you're building a design system and you think, all right, we're going to start building in January and by June it'll be done, uh, be fully fledged, it'll be set in stone, I'll never have to look at it again, you're only fooling yourself. Um, a design system is a living thing, so uh, everything in it is going to change. Um, this is a model that was taken from um, Pattern Languages, a Christopher Alexander book. Um, it's actually about architecture and about urban planning, but it has been referenced so many times by uh, different systems designers. Again, another book that's worth reading. Uh, but this is called the shearing model. And what it's doing is it's describing um, using kind of the analogy of a house or a building, how different elements of that structure change over time. Um, and the same kind of idea applies to design systems. Um, what I'll say is that your systems team, the team that are coming up with the governance for your system, need to think about this. And they need to think about what parts of the system are we going to allow to be changed uh, faster than others. So that might be, um, maybe your brand does a refresh every year. And so that's gonna have a toll on your system and you're gonna have to think about uh, what that would be and what the consequence of doing that would be. Um, but something like maybe your, um, your governance layer or your uh, design language, you might say, well, that's not gonna change all that often. Or maybe we don't want our UX patterns to change all that often. But the reality is, is that everything will change. You just have to kind of designate out uh, what your rate of change is gonna be. And that leads me on to uh, this point. Um, I think this probably doesn't affect, now I'm obviously making an assumption here, but I would say this problem doesn't affect um, companies that uh, don't have multiple sub-brands <laughs> um, or just smaller design system uh, teams. And what I'm talking about here is the tension between what does the system team do versus what does the product design team do? Um, you know, the users or the main users, I suppose, of the design system are other designers or developers, whereas the product design team, you know, their main focus is still supposed to be solving user needs, which might sound really simple, but, you know, sometimes there's a bit of tension there and we kind of forget that um, the two have to kind of work together to improve the system. It's not really just down to the design systems team just to build it and maintain it and somehow be the gurus to know uh, how to evolve the system in order for it to still work. You need to create these feedback loops um, from your product teams, from your engineering teams, what have you, to constantly improve uh, the system. So it's just, it's something small, but it is something that um, is often uh, forgotten about. Um, so yeah, so in the case of index, there's actually loads, just loads of feedback loops. I couldn't put them all onto one slide, but this is just a quick example. And I'll touch on one of the aspects of this later on as well. But in uh, our system, we have the core system. We also have this idea of having libraries. So those libraries might be specific to an area. So in this illustration, it's touch. They'll inherit a number of properties from the core system, but then a product design team might pull from both systems where only one, just depends. Um, but ultimately the product design team has um, some really 
important functions here. When they assemble their design um, and they user test it, it's really important that they send that user testing information and that research back to the to the systems team. Um, they also have the potential to contribute back in. Now, this mightn't be this case for all systems, but for our system, um, it it operates on the notion of inner source. So, if there's a gap there, there's a bug there, an enhancement there, there our product teams are empowered to actually make the change and uh, contribute it back in. Or you might have someone on the outskirts that are not actively engaging in product design, might be coming at this from an engineering, uh, performance, uh, security, compliance perspective, and they see a gap and they can contribute back in. So um, this is a way, I suppose, to both get adoption for your system, but then also um, you know, just bolster the uh, capabilities of it. Um, what did I want to say about this? Yeah, so initially our systems team was completely voluntary. And to be completely honest, if um, we were gonna do this again, I would say you need to just staff your design system team from day one. Um, as this thing grows, and as you've seen the complexity you can get into, um, you are in a very kind of delicate position where you need to ensure that whatever goes into your system um, is 100%, uh, you know, there's a top, the, there's a good quality there, but ultimately you have to build trust with your um, product design team. And that's really hard to do if your systems team is only working on this half time, okay? So uh, the way that we've attempted to fix this problem is we have our we have a really good balance in the index team between design dev and accessibility and they're more or less staffed like they work on that all the time and then you've got um our uh, touch library team who are working on products that have a kind of they have skin in the game they um they need the things that are going to be going into that library and um, so it, it's not completely half time if you if you will like there is uh, motivation there but that might be a way that you can uh, you know address that in your own uh, businesses but again I would say um, just from the maintenance perspective and the bug fixing sp perspective while you're trying to also build this thing out and um, having it staffed makes that a lot easier um, so this is just what is... oh sorry, sorry. Go on. Alec, yeah. hey what's up uh, I just wanted to jump in. If you can go back to the last slide, I'm kind of curious. Yeah. Um, so you have a lot of these blue circles kind of sitting, or on both teams, you have a circle that's in the middle. Is that sort of like a point type person of, of the projects or was that just, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, you do. You absolutely need that. Um, now, it's kind of funny in our setup, uh, we have like a lead designer that sits in that position, um, but, from my own experience, I would be saying we probably need to swap that person out for um, a product manager instead. Um, and that's mostly to do with the scale that we're talking about. So in a, you know, in, we'll say in a, in a normal scenario when you don't have to look after multiple brands and multiple regions and, uh, and the like, uh, a lead designer would probably be enough there or design director. Um, but a, a PM would be so much more useful uh, when you have multiple streams of work going on. So uh, yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. Okay, interesting, cool. Sorry, I just wanted to hop in, maybe give you a water break, ask a quick question. But... Oh yeah, sorry, you know, this is, <laughs> as you say, um, and for everyone on the call, um, you know, there's just so much to go into from a design system perspective. Um, you know, feel free to drop some questions, I'll go into it. Cool. Yeah, there's some questions. I was gonna hold them till the end, but if you want some, I, you know, I can serve them up. Uh, yeah, sure. If, if you want to ask, ask one or two. I'll... Cool. Um, yeah, we'll do a couple. Uh, what are the key moments? Kind of, you talked about how it started as a volunteer design project and your sure. journey. What were the key moments that got you to the point where, um, you know, working with internal stakeholders that it turned into a fully staffed team that was managing a product and what convinced um, the stakeholders to, to allow those resources kind of to move over? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so yeah, I suppose originally when, uh, as I say, when we were starting out, there was just a, a kind of a small select group of us. And um, I suppose it was really after we had created a proof of concept. So um, we were lucky in that there was this uh, kind of large scale, very visible uh, product that uh, was being created and we kind of created our design language around it. So it was more like, um, here's this future focused product and we want to bring what it has to lots of other products. And um, so that was kind of very useful. We already had some level of buy-in then at, at the top, but uh, of course we needed to be able to prove that we could do that. So um, on the design language front, that meant um, not solely creating something in Sketch as it was at the time, um, and kind of pitching it to design leaders, but getting it out there. So what we used was DSM um, to kind of show the relationship between, say, like what might be your design language, some uh, fairly high level documentation. We also created a Google site, which, you know, in hindsight probably wasn't uh, the, the most robust tool to use, but it was good yeah. in, in terms of we need to just get something out there. So what you were seeing on that was like the coming together of here's this design language, here's this uh, documentation in terms of how you would use it. And then having this like component library um, on the side and kind of showing the link between it. So, you know, it was very kind of uh, quick and dirty, I suppose, but it did illustrate where the value would be um, if we were to do this uh, for real. So that was, that was a really like, I suppose, a key turning point for us. And we were able to, at the time, and uh, we're just very fortunate that we were able to bring that all the way to the top to like the CPO and say, look, that we did this for X product and now we want to do it for all of these others. Um, this is what it's going to take. And it kind of really helped us to, uh, to kind of bring that conversation forward. But as I say, I suppose we're in a little bit of a unique scenario in that we all already had a massive problem. Like, 700 product experiences that need to be somehow unified so coming with a solution to that problem is going to give you a lot of clout it's not like you know we were sitting in a corner going hey it'd be nice if we had a design system that would make our lives easier right. we had you this had, like had. proper business problem that we needed to uh to solve yeah and then you wrote I, I like how you rode the momentum of the more visible project as well so yeah i think that's really smart okay cool um I'm, I'm gonna let you get back to it. Cool. That was a I was only question, only a few more. Th Thanks, Alec. Um, just a few more things here. So, coming back to systems concepts, um, again, this is something that maybe isn't uh, talked about enough. Um, but you know, after you get that system uh, going and you've got people using it, uh, you know, you're gonna need to start thinking about well. How do we architect the system in such a way that if we were to sub certain elements out, it would still stand? Um, you know, every system, as it turns out, has some level of self-organization in it. So if you're thinking that your system is going to be very rigid, there's a good chance it's going to have a very short lifespan. That might be okay, depending on which way you want to go with this, but it's just something again to keep in mind and uh, your every system has some level of hierarchy. Now, again, if you're looking at this from an atomic design perspective, um, that's not gonna be a big deal. You've kind of already got that covered. Um, so this is just a real life example of resilience. Um, we didn't build our system in such a way that we are too reliant on any uh, one element and where those, um, or sorry, on any one channel and where those uh, assets lived. And um, so, as I said, originally we had our kind of our uh, component library in Azure DevOps and we had our design language and all its associated components in Sketch. Um, and I suppose it was a real test of our system's resilience when we decided to migrate both of these uh, to different platforms. Um, would the system still hold, um, you know, if it, a uh, use case of where this wouldn't have held is if we didn't have documentation. Um, I know that there's some systems out there where um, it's almost like a sticker sheet and it's all annotated in um, Sketch. If you were to try and pull that into Figma, yeah, you could probably do it from a 
like a code asset perspective, or sorry, a, a design asset perspective. Um, but now you have to like rewrite all of your rules for your guidance for your designers and whatnot of how to use these things. Um, so thinking about that and kind of car compartmentalizing the different parts at the beginning can really help when stuff like this comes along. So the reason we did this is because of scale. Um, you know, we were paying for uh, individual seats in Sketch and the only people that could run Sketch was people on Macs. And, um, you know, also the appeal from Figma to basically allow anybody to go in there uh, from a product management perspective, uh, from a UX writing perspective, from a technical writer perspective, just had so much pull. And we were like, okay, well, we'll try and do that. We'll try and move everything into Figma and see how that goes. Um, and we had a reasonable degree of confidence that, that it would be fine and it turned out to be fine. Um, but it was because we had thought about this ahead of time because um, Figma may not be the end of the road for our design language either. There could be something else in like two years time that you will want to move to. So um, that's that would be one of the key things. Like if you're thinking your design system lives in Figma, I would just have another thought about that. Um, again, and the same sort of thing happened on the code side. Moving from your version control from Azure DevOps to GitHub technically isn't a big deal. It's all the ramifications for doing it. Um, so if you had uh, everybody push put pull, or pulling code from your repo, then you've got a lot of links out there that you're going to need to update. But if you had instead your uh, like maybe you would build a package of your components and that lives somewhere else that makes you know the transition from one version control system to another that much uh, easier so resilience would be something that from a systems design perspective you should be uh, thinking about at the get-go and um, self-organization and um, there's loads of different examples of this um, in ours, I would say the example is probably our uh, concept of, or our ability to adopt inner source as our contribution model. Um, so this kind of gives individuals uh, the power, the power not only to kind of evolve your system, um, but also for kind of specialized library groups to kind of organically form um, around common problems. Um, which your system hasn't addressed yet and solve them and contribute it back in. So it drives adoption levels, but then it also makes your system stronger in the long run. And finally, hierarchy. Um, again, from an atomic design perspective, it's more or less got you covered. Once you continue to take that idea and apply it to the different sub elements of your, um, your system. Um, so like an example of this might be, um, right, you have your design language and you've got your component library. Now let's think about um, what would be the next step after that. So in our case, that was multiple brands. How would we support that? Multiple themes, how would we support that? Uh, different libraries, um, where is the kind of uh, the starting point and the ending point uh, for a library in comparison to just putting it into your design language, what would be the ramification if you put it into your design language and then you wanted to do something else? So you're thinking of almost like the cause and effect of um, interacting with your system later down the line. Um, so then just switching quickly into the more tactical, because this is probably, um, you know, a little bit more interesting for some. And um, so we talked about earlier on kind of empowering our users through the system to do something uh, that perhaps they weren't able to do well before. Uh, taking that example of our backend devs that needed to do front end, but it wasn't our forte. Um, so this is one of our kind of key things that we we're looking at uh, when we are ar architecting the system. The example on the designer side would be the use of the Figma uh, program as a channel for designers. Um, you know, if people have used Figma before on this call, this is going to be no surprise, but these were some really key things for us um, that were really empowering. Um, so from a systems design perspective, 
the fact that we were able to just push new changes directly into existing files um, and that uh, designers could just accept the change, review and accept the change, like that was a big deal for us. And um, the fact that we could see analytics in terms of what is actually working in the system. What are people pulling? What are they detaching? What's not really working very well? And that um, enables us to improve the system over time. Um, and then other things like the ability to, um, you know, embed the uh, Figma file into uh, existing tools uh, like Jira and Rike and, and Rally and such. So it really starts to join up the two worlds outside of design and, and development. And then, as I say, bringing in other stakeholders into the design environment. Um, but on the dev side, um, this again was a challenge, uh, you know, having to support modern frameworks and legacy systems um, and different sorts of platforms. Um, on the web side, how we, how we solve for this is we used a combination of Stencil and uh, Tailwind. And they kind of did two different things for us. So on the Tailwind side of things, this is how we were able to empower our backend devs to write very nice looking uh, you know, UIs. And um, essentially they had a selection of uh, utility classes that they could just assign to their uh, you know, HTML code or different frameworks, whatever they're using, and it would create a beautiful UI for them. So they didn't even need to be good at CSS to, uh, to create what was being asked of them from a design side of things. And the naming um, in the, I suppose, the naming conventions used in those classes lined up with our design tokens and our kind of structure of our web components um, were reflective of the structure of our kind of elements in Figma. So there was a lot more uh, tightly knit um, kind of relationship there between different elements. Um, Stencil itself um, is only a web component compiler, um, but it's really useful for teams that want to not only consume the system, but also contribute back in. So we were able to kind of piggyback on that and uh, use a lot of its uh, different features for like, you know, pre-rendering or lazy loading or building in like a dev server into um, the build so that they can kind of test uh, on their own. But then the other thing from an accessibility perspective is we were able to include uh, things like the Axe Core uh, engine and run some like custom accessibility tests every time someone completes a build. Um, so that kind of, you know, feeds back into that other strategy that the design system is trying to um, address. Um, so there's lots of different ways that you can go about this. Um, you know, you don't necessarily, if you want to use web components, you don't necessarily have to use Stencil. You could use something like Polymer and um, that works as well. And the other thing actually that I left out with Tailwind is it allowed us to uh, support themes. Um, so from one code base, we could just import another theme from a different business unit in uh, the company and that would kind of auto scan all of the components to fit into that uh, that other product experience. So um, yeah, this was kind of, I suppose it's a little bit of the secret sauce. It's not the full thing, but um, yeah, happy to go into more detail on either of these um, later on. So just to finish up, um, quick quote from Dan Mal. It's a super important just in the in the grander scheme of things, but you know, design systems are there to take care of that boring 80% uh, because everybody wants to be, you know, in that exciting, innovative, forward forward looking user problem solving 20%, right? We don't want to be in the 80%. So if you can uh, take anything from this, uh, you know, I would say just pour yourself into creating a really kind of robust, really fleshed out system and then just allow the system to take care of that boring stuff because like you don't want to be doing it. Nobody wants to be doing that stuff. Um, so at the end of this deck, between this slide and the next, I'm not going to read this out. We can kind of look at it in your own time. Um, I've left some resources here. So there's links out to different Medium articles or different books that I'd recommend um, you, you take a look at and that would really help you kind of like get going, especially when you're starting to kind of say, all right, I've got the component library bit down, I've got the design language piece down. How do I like really shape this into a machine rather than it being um, 
you know, just these elements existing on their own. Um, so yeah, open to discussion, chats, the whole shebang. Sorry, Alec, I actually can't hear you at the moment. Ah, uh, technology. Okay, it looks like Alec will be jumping in. Um, I did have um, a question for you. Um, sure. One thing is doing design. Mm -hmm. Another one is doing design for enterprise systems. I mean, that's that's always the thing. One thing is like programming, developing, and another is developing for enterprise systems. Yep. It seems like you not only did that, but you did that at scale. How was the process in getting it? It was probably an iterative process the whole way through to get to being at that scale to where you can even white label. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I suppose we were, we were again, very fortunate in that the... <laughs> The product that we went after, see, I'm not even sure if I'm allowed to say its name, so I'm just going to call it the product. <laughs> the product that we were uh, working with at the time was so robust and it literally went straight across uh, the enterprise. So we were exposed to a lot of things that we were going to need to consider later down the line at the beginning. Um, and as well as, that, as well as that, just kind of, you know, really um, just, you know, Taking it, taking it upon ourselves to reach out to like privacy and security and um, the systems architects to kind of, you know, we knew we were on the right uh, wavelength, but we weren't 100% certain at the start what, what was the level that we were going to need to hit for this to work. Um, so that, that's kind of what I was saying at the beginning is a lot of this is, you know, swinging by people's desks when we could do that <laughs> and you know going for a coffee and just having kind of a casual conversation bringing people through where you're at where you're going um, and trying to get a sense from them and their experience you're really trying to just like vacuum up their experience like and um, what are the things that we're missing here and um, this seems too easy and if that's the case you probably are missing a few things so yeah like the white labeling piece um we, I'd say Tailwind got us about 50% of the way there. And then what we needed to do was start looking at, well, and it's the same, actually, it's the same problem we have with DSM. You have this notion of tokens, right? Design tokens. It's like, where do they, where do they live? Um, and if they live on a third party server, which could be the case if you're using DSM, mm -hmm. at scale for 700 products where you could have like thousands of users, um, and they all going to have to make concurrent calls to that one instance to grab those tokens. Or does that mean that you should cache the token somewhere else? And if you cache it, does, how will versioning work? So, you know, you start to go down the rabbit hole and start figuring that out. Um, but then, you, you know, you can come back up again. You can come up to the sensible solution of uh, maybe every time you do a release, you put it on a CDN and everyone points at the CDN. So, like... You know, you start to have much more in-depth conversations. Where we actually ended up is looking at something more centralized, like Artifactory, and kind of pushing it in there so that everybody gets. So you're kind of like, you know, you get your package, you get your package manager, but you get a little bit more as well. So, um, yeah, conversations uh, with with as many people as possible is the answer to that question. Thank you. Okay, I think I'm back. Can you all yeah, hear me? I can see you, Alec. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You can see me and hear me. I can that's hear you. Yeah. The double. Yeah, that's it. Um, cool, man. Yeah, no, that was a great talk. I I am going through a lot of the exact same things right now, so super super relevant. I, I'm kind of curious about um, the diagram that you had at one point in time. Yeah. Where you, where you sort of that. yeah sort of in the middle where you talked about. Um, Bam, there it is. So whenever you're, you kind of started working on this, is this something that you had a clear idea of at the start? Is this like, hey, this is going to, and, and governance, you're talking about that kind of stuff. This is yeah. how we're going to, we're going to hit all these things or. I, I think you this is, your head, so. yeah, this is probably more accurate of where we were at the beginning. Um, like when it's highlighted blue. 
yeah, like we had the notion that we were going to have component, like a component library, um, because there was one being kind of like built for this other product. So we're like, all right, well, that makes sense. Um, but what we didn't know is where the ownership of that should lie. And it's interesting how things evolve over time. So even on that, um, if we were to break that down a little bit, um, initially we were thinking, right, the design language is probably enough and we can kind of farm out the design tokens and then that can go into your component library. The problem that we came up against, and it was the reason why we went in a different direction, is if you go that way, you have one team that say builds a library in React, and you have another team that builds a library in Angular. Now you need to make sure that the UI between those two frameworks is consistent. And um, what happens if one team um, says, hey, we got this idea of, uh, of a pattern or a element from our designer that isn't in the system and your approach is fine, contribute it to the system. Great, now you've got one component library that has an extra element in it that the other component library doesn't have. So how are you gonna solve that? And that's where we kind of really came at this from the framework agnostic approach um, where we could kind of contribute in at a web component level and then consume that from different frameworks. So it allows you to get much more reach, but then it's also very manageable because um, you've only one code base to look after. Yeah. Um, so that, that, that would be kind of an example, I suppose, at the beginning where we're kind of like, okay, this is easy. And then you realize, oh, actually in a production world, that's not gonna work out so well. Yeah, because there's so many different variables and everybody needs something just a little bit specific for their for their problem, I think. Yeah, um, yeah. One, one question that we had come in earlier was around uh, content and like, how do you see content kind of fitting into the design system? That is a great question. And it's actually, I have a, I had a note here, like that was one thing on this perspective uh, that we're actually trying to figure out right now. <laughs> so um, we have like, I suppose the, where the question has gone is like, well, because a system could take on the form of whatever your business needs. And uh, so, as I say, like, this isn't the be all and end all what we're looking at here on, on the screen. Um, technical writing and UX writing have come into the fold and we're like, well, where would that live? Like, would that be in the design language or would that be in documentation? Um, or is it its own like element and maybe it feeds into these different things. So that's kind of where we're at at the moment. That's probably going to end up as its own node in this system and it will feed into different elements uh, within within the system itself. But I suppose it doesn't stop there because there's other concepts of like, well, um, this is obviously a design system for digital products. We have a whole suite of other products that are physical products. Do you need a different design system for them or should they cross over in some way because you know you're going to have experiences to transcend platforms so how does that work so you know it this is why i'm saying it's kind of like you kind of get into this really good space where once you've applied systems thinking to one side of the problem then you can start kind of applying it to the other and see where the where things start to marry i suppose right yeah whenever you have like a marketing a marketing team that's trying to use the same brand components or they're updating their brand side and they want it to follow through um, yeah so i suppose in our in our case we kind of draw a line between product design and brand like there mm -hmm. is a crossover um that kind of as i went back through i think it's yeah here where you can kind of see um you can use my cursor. Yeah, you can see the difference between so identities is what we would call brand and uh, utility, which is really like the functional uh, reason behind why you might have certain color swatches or whatever, but this would persist across uh, the system. And, um, you know, I think it's really important, especially when you get into concepts like accessibility and um, that, that I suppose your brand uh, it has a little bit of a safeguard there where cosmetic things are not impacted by the accessibility guidelines, but UI that you need to use uh, to achieve a particular goal 
and that's the utility so you need sure, to yeah. address that so it's kind of like if you don't make a if you don't make um a, i suppose uh kind of a segment or an uh, ability to 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 uh break those apart now it's going to get really messy and really political later on when you're trying to make just a simple product experience so um yeah no that makes a lot of sense um i'm gonna go over a couple of announcements because i know we're 10 minutes over so oh, sorry and it, that's okay the talk's been awesome so i think hopefully people have hung around and kind of enjoyed so um we are going to stay virtual for now uh okc design and tech while you know, coronavirus is still at large we're just gonna kind of continue to play it safe we're we're looking at different options to try and get the crowd more involved into our talks so um be looking out for that in our next meetup which is coming in march um we're going to talk about how to get unstuck break free from your cognitive bias so that is on our meetup page and you can see more details about that um it'll be march 31st so at the same time um should be should be pretty fun uh the other thing i want to say is everybody who came out to okux thank you for coming out and supporting us and supporting um just the further and continued knowledge of ux and ui design in oklahoma so that was a really really successful first first conference and we're gonna do it again next year so keep your eyes out for that Sweet. Those are all my announcements. So if anybody was sitting around waiting for the announcements, that that's you know we got through those. Continue to support Oklahoma. Um, what kind of other questions do do y'all have for James? If there's any, I'm still checking the Twitch chat. So if you have anything that pops into mind, send it in the Twitch chat, and I'll I'll put it out here. But I can hang out for another 15 minutes. So I'm down to keep talking. Sweet. Yeah. I'll stick around. So <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, like, it's the end of my day, so I'm happy to just chat away. <laughs> yes. I'm no. kind of curious, um, whenever you're organizing components in Figma, and this is sort of technical on the Figma side, and I don't know if this is exactly your, your job as, no, no, like, fine. management, yep. but how do you find it best whenever you're dealing with things that are on the atomic level that you don't necessarily, maybe they are um, pieces that go together in a component, like... For example, I'm thinking of we have a stepper component that uses a couple different circles and you don't necessarily want the designers grabbing these circles on their own. Um, how do you organize that effectively in your system? Well, I suppose most recently we've been um, leveraging variants um, yeah. to kind of get around that problem. Because I know before, yeah, we would have had, I suppose, a little bit of an issue where... Um, they were kind of subcomponents in a component, and you didn't necessarily want someone to use a subcomponent in isolation. Um, so unfortunately, we just kind of like plowed through and kind of gave some guidance and hope for the best. Um, but now with the um, inclusion of variants in Figma, it's just made that whole piece a lot easier because we can kind of just lock it in at the, what would you say, like the master component level, not the nested components and yeah. uh, they don't get access to those but they can still flick between the variants to give them the different states so um that's kind of our way around it at the moment that's pretty cool yeah i've been playing around with with variants and and everything like that we were thinking of just going through and and labeling things atoms and kind of creating like oh if you need atoms you can look in this folder but hopefully that keeps them where they're not necessarily using them as much but yeah and it's it's funny like on our side um just for i suppose ease of release uh whenever our kind of release cycle comes around again after a few sprints we separated out um our kind of our atoms or our foundations as we call them uh, from our elements and from our ux patterns into separate files um but the each kind of like um it still follows the atomic design idea where you're in your UI elements file, you are pulling in stuff from your library, which happens to be your foundations. So mm -hmm. everything's interconnected, but then what that allows us to do is that if we do make any changes to the foundations file, you know, the next time you, you know, all we need to do from a 
design systems perspective, it just pops into the UI file and accept the changes. And then this is, there you go. We've made all the changes to our elements that had consumed those atoms and then uh, up into our patterns. So um, I know people are kind of fond of like blasting everything into the same file, but that kind of makes it tricky when you want to just do, you know, you just want to target one thing. Like you don't want people to freak out that there's a new version of the language or something like that. Um, when you've only like, as you say, like changed an icon or choose change a step or something like that. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of, that makes sense. Yeah, we have our foundation separate, but right now for, for my my team, what, what we have in there is just colors, typography, um, icon, iconography, uh, our grid system. So those those types of things, but yeah, maybe, maybe adding some of those atom level things would help as well. The other thing I'd like to see in Figma that isn't there yet um, is um, like some way to capture motion in your foundations file. Because of course, the only way that we can do it now is to have a board that says, hey, these are the curves that you should use, or these are the uh, keyframes yeah. that you should set. And obviously replicate that on the code side. So it's just like, you know, appending a class name. But, you know, for the part that's missing there is when you go to do your prototype now as a designer that you kind of have to manually go in and assign your curves to your different uh, UI pieces to kind of sync that up. But if there was a way we could do that in Figma, that'd be uh, right. way, it's, way it's better. It's pretty un... un like there's not a lot of customization you have either other than time and the type of curve. You can't really get too detailed in, in how it's going without... Um, I use Figamation, I think is oh, what yeah. it's called. Yeah, um, that's cool. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's definitely more more work, but... I, you I get your nice timeline in that, don't you? Yeah, you have a whole yeah. timeline view and you can affect things and twist things and move them around and spin them and stuff, so... Okay. So we're going to go ahead and um, wrap this, the actual formal presentation up. I'm going to stop the stream, but thank you very much, everyone, for tuning in. We're going to be dropping a link to this meet so that you can try and kind of ask questions directly to James. We're trying this for a first time. So I'll go ahead and drop that into the OKC Design Tech, Tech Oklahoma Slack, once this is offline. And uh, we can go ahead and go from there. But thank you very much, James, for your time. Thanks, Alex, for moderating. And... Um, thanks, everyone, for watching. Yes, Sweet. bye, everybody. Hop thanks, in. Guys. Come say hi.